Thanks, Matt. Uh, most of that was true. Um, if Matt could have scored, I would have passed the ball. But now he scores well in the bank account, which he is freely sharing with you. So, um, I appreciate his friendship, and he is a great mentor. So, uh, let me talk for just a second. I have a thought as we have the hard money guy here explaining who has had a deal under contract, and they went to fund it, and they got turned down by the raise of hands. Okay? Now, who has had a deal under contract, they went to fund it, they got turned down, and then they pulled some comms, and they talked their way to get the deal done? Anyone? Nobody? All right, perfect. Okay. So uh, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say here and what makes um, a good comparable. But before I do that, uh, Matt encouraged me to share what one of my first flips was. And when I first got going, if you go to the next slide, um, I'm pretty proud of this house. I probably owned seven or eight rentals. I had actually done a spec house before I ever flipped a house. So from an experience, I, this was my first deal. Bought it in 2005. Um, I'm proud of that first picture on the first left because I turned this very poor house with literally paper, cardboard walls, gutted it. It was a three and one, I, or maybe it was a two and one. I turned it into a three and two. And you'll see that little indentation right around the toilet. Uh, that's because through my inexperience, we plumbed it too close to the wall and I had to think creative. And so we framed it back out and we made it right. And so. In a nutshell, that's kind of me. I'm the fitting around the toilet, and uh, it's very useful, but I made it happen. And so, as you can see, uh, I, I bought it for 50 grand, and I sold it for 132 and 05. Um, so it was, that was my very first flip, my introduction to flipping real estate, and that's really what I enjoy doing the most out of real estate, you know, in, in regards to long-term holds. So, um, let's go to the next slide. Now, when we have a perspective of what value is, if we all had the same perspective, would there ever be any speculation in the market? You would never buy a property because everybody had the exact same view. Sometimes we have to take some risks, sometimes we have to take some chances, sometimes we have to do some things that maybe our family would tell us not to do, our best friends, but if we've got the appropriate value and data, it's really not much of a risk. It's a super educated risk that I'm 100% comfortable making if I've got the right data. So when I always say an, an appraiser's opinion is just one person's uh, opinion that day and time. The very next day, he could have a different opinion. Okay, and just because an appraiser has that opinion doesn't mean that is the gospel. Okay. Um, now, I, I totally respect an appraiser's opinion. A lot of times I'll use it, but I can tell you this much. Uh, at a property last month that tax records showed this property was 3,600 feet. I had not set foot in the property. I saw from the pictures and I said, this property is bigger than that. I know it is. So I'm not qualified to typically measure this type of house. It's a very large house. So we hired an appraiser to go measure the property. He measured it at a little over 6,000 feet. And he gave me a full valuation of five, what was it, five seventy nine, as is. And he said it needed about twenty thousand dollars worth of work, which was pretty debatable. So we put it on the market. And let me back up for a second. Originally, we thought this property was worth. Well, we had two offers at three eighty cash, and they were the sellers were considering taking that. So. We got the appraisal at my recommendations. We want to figure out exactly what we have. Okay, we put it back on the market. We put it on at 469. We got about seven offers within about four or five days. And it just funded today at, I think, 483. So the point is, the appraiser had a different view than we did. I'm not saying he's right or I'm right. They're just differences in opinion. Okay, now that cash the investor that bought that Maybe he's going to turn that into an $800,000 property. Who knows? Okay? So uh, the appraiser's opinion is typically present value. They're going to call it as is. This is the way it is. They don't have a lot of functionality to go and say, this is what it could be if you put $30,000 worth of effort and blood, sweat, and tears and granite into. Okay? So 
In an appraisal, another thing, I have a mortgage lending background, and what that does is it kind of helps me associate values a little bit differently than maybe the average person. So uh, in, in, an in an appraisal, you've got three different approaches. As you can read, there's income comparison and cost. The one you're probably most familiar with, the comparison approach, right? It's a comp. If you've got four comps, you've got evaluation, right? Well, in commercial world, and we're gonna kind of tailor this towards residential tonight, you have income, and if you've got better income than your neighbor, then you're, of course, you've got a value that's commensurate with the income that's sitting there, okay? So let's look at some different uh, investor perspectives. Next slide. Okay, so I'll go through the 10 items, and the first thing that I do whenever I pull a value or I'm looking at the property, I have to identify my subject. So number one, some of this is gonna be super elementary to some of you, and some of you, you're gonna click a few, a few slides, and you're gonna say, I can add this to my arrow, my quiver, and make it better, okay? So the first thing I do is I go to the MLS, and I'm gonna look for the, the total history on that property. And sometimes you're gonna have to search, sometimes it's gonna have a different street, may have changed names, maybe a number, now it's a word street, okay? I'm sure you've all found that, right? So I'm gonna find the history of that property. What I'm also gonna look for is the pictures, if there's been a prior um, listing, I'm gonna see what the condition of the property was, how relevant that is. Let's say there's nothing there. Let's say there is there, I'm gonna print that out. Next thing I'm gonna to go to is the tax data. Why? Because just because a realtor put it on at a certain square footage, bedrooms and bathroom, does that mean it's accurate? Absolutely not. I'm gonna to go to look for a second source, I'm gonna to go to the tax records, okay? I'm gonna look at that. Now sometimes you don't have the listing history, all you have is the tax records. I'm a visual person, many of you are, I'm gonna find a way to look at that property, whether from the comfort of my computer, okay? I'm gonna look at Google Maps, I'm gonna look at, some counties have super old pictures you can look at, it tells you a lot whether it's a flat roof, a pitched roof, if there's a garage, uh, whether there's window wells, what the front is, you know, curb appeal, all that. Okay, that's what I'm gonna to do to identify my subject right off the bat, because unless you know what you've got, you can't contrast it to anything else, okay? So proximity, this is, this is a big one. Uh, most appraisers, most valuations. By the way, I'm gonna give you kind of 10 rules, and then in all reality, all 10 of the rules can be broken, okay? So it really doesn't help you any, right? We're gonna try, okay? So most, most of the time, I'm gonna plan a square mile radius. Now we know how many, does anybody know how many blocks it takes to get a mile in Utah? All right, eight. So back in the old MLS, you had to go four north, four south, fourth west, fourth east of the subject. Now we've got a great tool that will do a radius search, okay? So if you've got a property on sixth east and 17th south, and you use a comp that's 15th east and the same south, Will that be a comp? No. Not always, right? Maybe. But I'd say, I typically say no because we have some imaginary boundaries, we have some lines we've got to follow. So it may be better to have something that's next door on the same street, identical, okay? That's what we want if we can get it, okay? So timing. Do we always go 180 days back? Matt, what did we do in 2010? We went to 90 days, right? And sometimes, mortgage lending, what do we go? Back in 2007, sometimes 60 and 30 days. That's right. So you've got to be cognizant of what your market's doing. Now, I'm going to tell you, everybody here can do it themselves. You can find your own comps. You can access the MLS. You can do whatever you do with Zillow. I would recommend it, but you can do it. Okay? Now, the other thing with timing I'm going to tell you about is kind of one of my concerns, I guess, at this present time is winter comps, right? Who bought, a, who bought a property in the last two weeks? Are you, how are you basing values there? So if you go back six months, you're basing off maybe some June, July, August comps that are historically some of our best ones because those are the warmest months, right? So if you're basing your value off those comps, Let's say you fix it up and it takes you, what, 30, 45, 60 days to do a pretty decent rehab. And if you do that, when are you selling it? You're selling it uh, late December, January. Who's buying homes? 
A lot of, you, did you see a lot of people moving the, the week between Christmas and New Year's? What about your hard money mom? Is he concerned about that? So just be careful going into those seasonal comps because it, it might be 180 days now, but it may not be when February rolls around, okay? Now who knows, I didn't, I didn't bring my crystal ball tonight. Uh, who knows what valuations are gonna, gonna do in December and January, but I, I don't, it's just my opinion, I don't expect it to be as hot as it was last summer, okay? So similarity. Um, when we talk about, I, I just wrote two, two below and two above. Um, I'm not a statistical whiz by any means, but if you've got different stats here, you see the most might be right through this area. Some people are going to pull this as a comp, and this is a comp, and this is a comp, and they're going to use that as their only cost for their subject, when their subject is really right here. So what I say is you want to have two above the line and two below the line as a minimum. You want to have two that are inferior comps to your subject and two that are superior. Okay? Now there are definitely tolerances. We talk about tolerances. How many agents are here? That's quite a bit. Who's done a BPO before? Is that not maddening? You do a lot of work for no money. But what does it give you? It gives you a ton of experience, right? Learn about GLA, learn about um, square footages and what's, everybody know what GLA is? Randall kind of hashed on it, which I'm okay with. It's anything above the ground level and up. Okay, so they don't, an appraiser's not going to count your square footage in the basement as valuable as you would on the main floor. But one thing he said was like for like. So if you've got two 1,800 square foot homes sitting next door, one is all above grade, there's no basement. And then there's another one that has 900 up and 900 down. They're both bungalow cottages, right? What do they have different valuations? Yes. They, they very much can. And, and sometimes, uh, if that's the only one with 1800 GLA, it, it, you, it may sell just the same as the 1800 one with 900 up and 900 down. But understand, you need to have like for like. Okay. So. An appraiser's gonna go in, he's the one that's qualified to go in and make adjustments. Okay, he's gonna say, I'm gonna adjust a three-car garage to a two-car garage, and he's qualified to do that. For me, I'd like to stay as safe as possible and only compare a two-car garage to a two-car garage. Now, one of the other reasons I'm, I'm sharing some of these things is that I have people that will bring me deals to buy, which I love. I wanna buy more wholesale deals, but they'll bring me comps and they'll say it's worth this. And I'm like, okay, thanks for your opinion. Uh, how, once I do my search, I say, you compare it to three car garage and this has a one car carport. Does that match at all? I would personally never base any of my dollars based on uh, a carport to a garage type thing. Now, with that being said, sometimes I will do a one car garage to a carport. Or if I'm buying a two-car carport and it can be easily converted to a two-car garage, I'm living in the future, right? My perspective is, is changed based on that after repair value and what I can do to it. Okay? So just don't make the garage switch. Uh, that's a tough, it's a tough sell. Okay? Let's go to the next slide, please. We talked about GLA. It's not too big of a deal for me to, to swap values between a two-bedroom, one or three-bedroom. I'm not super concerned about that, but if you've got a six bedroom house to a two bedroom house, or if you've only got a one bedroom house, that's fine, but make sure there's plenty of room so that you can make some additional bedrooms to that property. Because there's not too many people looking for one bedroom properties, okay? So acreage, I don't see a ton of difference between a 0.18 acre and a 0.23 acre. Very minimal adjustments, but if you have a property that's two thirds of an acre, which I had last year, 1,400 square foot house, old farmhouse, nothing else within three miles had sold similar to that. Did I have a hard time pulling comps? I had a very difficult time. But because I did this every day, I kind of had a feeling. So I said, hey, I think this property is worth 150. Okay? I didn't have the data to produce it without going behind many of those tolerances, but we were able to produce it. Okay, we got a value, we were able to sell the property. In fact, uh, just two months ago, 
I ended up having to go 10 miles to produce comps for this exact rural property. Question? So Justin, in that example, let's say that seller goes to Matt from work, okay, and then Matt goes to find comps, he can't find his support values. Aren't you done? Have well, you not necessarily. Forget about the fact that Matt's involved, that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, seriously, would that kill you? Well, the appraiser is going to make a lot, they're going to have a lot more liberty to make those adjustments than you, you or I can do as an agent or a do it yourself or whatever. So they will assess the value and they will work until they find it. Even if they have to make adjustments that are 10 miles away, they can do it. Yeah, but does that, does that make it more competitive with stuff? I mean, particularly when you go distance and you go time, you go going architecture. It can, but here's the thing. I'm not trying to be the most unique guy. I'm looking, when we go to, when we look at stats, anybody familiar with the bell curve, standard deviations? It's like 68% is where you want to be than one standard deviation of your subject, okay? You go start going too far beyond that, you've got 95% is gonna fit between here, okay? Some people are gonna play out here in the point percents and try to call that a comp. And I'm just saying, you're just putting yourself at risk. There's exceptions to every rule. That's why I say, we're going through the top 10 that I feel are probably the most basic. If banks have a problem, they'll do four steps. One is, they'll, if you guys want to write this down, one's called an ABM, an automated value method. The lender will pull this independently just to get their own warm and fuzzy. If they don't feel comfortable with that, they'll then do what's called a desk review. So the bank will actually pay another appraiser on their staff just to review the comps from their desk. If they don't feel comfortable with this, they will do a field review. That's actually a drive-by appraisal that they'll actually take photos of the property, look at comparisons, and then if your house is like impeccably, unbelievably remodeled inside, and you have to have the appraiser look inside the property, then they'll just do a full-blown appraisal. I just closed on a client today that he had to go through an ABM, a desk review, and a field review, but after they all checked off, it, it came in at value. So the bank just wants to make sure if they have to foreclose, that they have to get asked that way. And if, and if you're doing short sales or anything else, you're going to see multiple valuations. Just if you're flipping a property, the 90-day flip rule, you might be paying two, two appraisals. The bank is definitely a lot more stringent than they ever used to be, and they're going to protect their assets. So. Make sure your data is right because, I don't know about you, I don't really love putting my money at risk or my future at risk or my future dollars, so I want to make sure I'm pretty, I'm pretty educated with that, okay? Anybody own more than, uh, than a single family property? Duplex, triplex, fourplex? Anything more than, a, than fiveplex or more? Okay, so we're talking about income approach. Does anybody wonder how we get new values? Does anybody wonder how the, how somebody can value an asset downtown that's a skyscraper? There's no there's no comparison like the World Trade Center, right? How do they assess a value? How do they get a loan? How do they make it work? It's the income approach. You need to get start getting familiar with net operating income with cap rates because you're not going to always be investing in single family properties, and pretty soon you're going to start to assess the value of your portfolio by accounting standards and, and what cash on cash return money you're getting for your dollars. And if you buy this property, what's that gonna return for you in the future, okay? So start thinking about the income approach because it's a very real value of your assets, okay? Uh, I looked at a property two days ago um, and I was perplexed by this property because on paper it showed everything. It showed me what I wanted what I was willing to pay, so I got in my truck, I went and looked at it. When I got there, I walked through the property, came out, walked around it, said, hey, can I go back through the property again? Walked back through it, still confused. And I, I'm a pretty particular guy, so I drove down the road, still thinking about how I could make this deal work. I got out of my vehicle to go grab something to eat, and I just left the thing running, walked in, didn't even think about it. I'm like, where are my keys? Went out, my truck's still running. It's really weird, I was perplexed, okay? But that was number 10. My gut was telling me no, but my mind really wanted to do this deal, okay? So what I did, but why, why I was so perplexed is I drove some of the comps. See, before I even went to that property, 
before they were seen with my own eyes. I'd already pulled comps. I had 10 comps sitting there with the subject right there with one little staple in it. I was confused looking around. I drove around to the comps and I saw, look, all the comps are brick. This one has siding. The owner told me it's insulated. They did everything to it. And it's ugly vinyl siding. In this particular area, there's no way I'm going to sell this for this top comp that I needed to based on my rehab. So I decided not to do the deal. And sometimes you've got to drive comps. If you need to look at visual aids, you need to get really good with some technology. Google's not that complex. Okay, but you can tell a lot about a property without wasting a ton of gas and effort, okay? Number eight, trending market. Um, who only pulls sold, sold comps? I pull actives and under contracts. Does anybody else do that? I didn't go to, I don't know, some traditional realtor school. I don't know what they teach you about how to pull comps. It's mainly through experience for me. Uh, the declining of the market required us to pull actives and under contract because the lenders required it on a national level in 2007 to 2008 as the market was down. Okay, so I, I will still do that because sometimes I won't have the necessary comparables I need in the solds. So I'll look to read the market and see what actively is selling, what's going under contract. Now I don't have a value on the under contract, but I have a general semblance of what's happening, what's selling. I look at that and I'm like, why is that under contract? That's pretty ugly. Mine is far superior to that. What can I sell it for in the same ballpark? Okay, so that's a, a huge trend for me. You'll always see me looking at, at briefs, uh, and that's the view of it. Um, Trevor? The other awesome reason to look at tactics is to check how long they've been on the market without selling. Right, good point. So um, I like to see my competition. I've walked through a number of competitors and seen what type of materials, what type of quality of construction they're doing. This is a good way to you to, for you to see how long it's going to take on market to sell. Okay? Um, cost per foot. In my opinion, a lot of that, if you're basing this a large position on, on whether you buy or sell a property based on cost per foot, I would caution you to be very careful. Now, if you're extremely experienced and you think you can get this valuation, you base it solely on cost per foot, I would call it fool's gold. Fool's gold. Um, so just be very careful. Now it may be an analyzation tool, but I would never make a buying decision with that probably in my top five. Okay, any questions on that one? Some people are gonna feel differently. You can type that into your three car garage scenario because a home with a three car garage next to a two car garage home, the price per square foot of the GLA will be higher in the three car garage, even though they may be very similar homes, but the garage will skew your price per square foot. Exactly. Basically what he's saying is if you have two houses next to each other, you've got one that's 600 feet and one that's 1,800 feet, they're going to be a very different cost per square foot calculation, even though they're the exact same house other than the size. So just be extremely careful, use like for like. Okay. Um, gut check. I, I kind of feel like most people don't hit this on the head more than they should. Um, there, I mean, there are times I do a deal and I'm like, the numbers say yes, and I don't know if I should do it, but I don't have a deal to do, so I'll do it. And I've done it, and I've made some, some good profit. But you've got to be very careful about your numbers. So it's just like this other deal I looked at in the avenues. My gut check just said no. Even though the numbers said I, could, I might be able to pull it off, I'm just... I'm just past that point where I feel like I have to risk too much to try to make uh, a small sum. So know what your tolerance is, know what your criteria is, and um, you know we talk about being able to do it yourself. You've got to get the correct information. Um, we all know I'm a realtor, so I feel comfortable in saying this. We're not the smartest bunch sometimes, right? We we have to go to a very short amount of schooling. And all of a sudden, we're licensed to sell real estate. Does that mean we know everything? We don't know. You should be asking your realtor or your agent or wherever it is for the data. Don't just go off their opinion. If they say, hey, this is worth 150, hey, let me see some comps. The very first property I ever bought, I, was, I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't know if I was going to flip it. I didn't know if I was going to rent it. I didn't know if I was going to move into it. I had the total wrong philosophy. Now I know within five minutes of walking to that property, 
I know what I'm going to do with it. I know I'm going to finance it. If I'm going to finance it, what it's going to cost to rehab it. If I'm going to get a takeout loan, I know all that and I plan that. And it goes quite a bit smoother from the get-go. Okay? So use who you need to use. Use who you trust, who you feel confident with, but get the data. Okay? It's not wrong to ask the comps. My very first house I bought, the only reason I bought it is he kept showing me properties. I finally put two and two together. There's two properties in the same neighborhood. One's $20,000 less than that one. My agent was an idiot. But it worked out just by the grace of the market. Okay? It just bailed me out. You can plan a lot more better. It's not even English. You can plan more better. Yeah, the biggest thing is that it's not their money. They just don't look at it like you do. Right? I don't care how good they are. Even I've had really good realtors. I'm a realtor. But if it's not your money at risk, it's, there's just a different feeling, a different intensity. So be careful. It's absolutely correct. What about the age of home? Is the age of the age of the home, yes. Uh, okay, so age of the home, I want to be sold. Show me. Show me what you got. Give me some comps. Okay, it's not wrong to work in sales. It's not wrong to sell me. But in the end, I'm going to look at the data and I'm going to make my own decision. Okay? So uh, it's a complex market. So this quote says you can have all the data you want, but learning how to analyze the data is where the magic is. Um, whoever it is that's helping you make your investment or buying decision needs to help you wrap your head around it and put the magic for it, okay? Um, and I believe if you can pull better comps, if you can get me better comps, I, I can make a faster decision. Matt can make a faster decision. Who wants to buy? Who's looking to buy a wholesale deal? I certainly am. I can make a much quicker decision if you give me the proper data, okay? Any questions on my top 10 or what you think is contradictory to what you think? It's full time versus part time. So I feel like if you've got a full time agent that they're doing it every day rather than working at Best Buy at night, um, they've got a pulse on the market. So sometimes I will not be able to produce those comps, but I can say, hey, I work in this area, I know it. I think I can get this value, regardless of the data that I can prove. Now, of course, if I hire an appraisal at four to $500, he's gonna issue me a value, hands down. And he'll do it, he'll make the adjustments, he'll do whatever. But more than, on more than one occasion, I've been able to say, why didn't you consider this comparable? Did you look at this one? I mean, if, especially if you're negotiating obsolescence or repairs or short sales, of course you're gonna give them the worst comps, right? But sometimes you have to show an appraiser that he was just too focused, too narrow-minded to see, oh, this property is 11 years older rather than just 10. It's a perfectly good comp that he could make a great adjustment for. Okay? Anything else? So next slide. So that, are, that is my 10 ways to increase value, take luck out of the equation, and help you produce better values because the bottom line is this, especially if you're flipping properties and you're dealing after repair value, you have to have a much different opinion of the, of the market. Okay, If you're lending hard money, you've got to understand exactly and trust what that investor is going to do and how they're going to do it in the time frame they're going to do it. Because if they screw it up, your money's at risk. Okay, So that is my contact information. If you have any questions, um, Red Hat. Hey, Justin, a quick question. Let's say, for example, you have a property that what is the best way to substantiate that 